Good afternoon and welcome to this, uh, for my money, the second most beautiful room in Chicagoland area. The first being the John Paul II Chapel at Mundelein Seminary. <laughs> it is indeed my distinct privilege to introduce to you the speaker for today, Dr. Scott Hahn. Dr. Hahn graduated from the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in 1982 with his Master of Divinity degree. He was ordained a Presbyterian minister and served for 10 years in a variety of churches and ministries. At the Easter Vigil in 1986, he entered the Catholic Church. He received his PhD in theology from Marquette University in 1995. He's taught at the University of St. Francis in Joliet, Illinois, and for the past 25 years at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. From 2002 to 2004, he occupied the Pio Cardinal Laghi Chair of Catholic Theology at the Pontifical Seminary Josephinum in Columbus, Ohio. From 2005 to 2011, he occupied the Pope Benedict XVI Chair of Biblical Theology at St. Vincent Seminary in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And I am exceptionally proud to say he currently holds the William and Lois Mackesy Distinguished Professorship in Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization at our own Mundelein Seminary. Dr. Hahn has authored or co-authored over 40 books, including The Lamb's Supper, A Father Who Keeps His Promises, Answering the New Atheism, Kinship by Covenant, Covenant and Communion, the Biblical Theology of Pope Benedict XVI, and a personal favorite of mine, Politicizing the Bible, the Roots of Historical Criticism and the Secularization of Scripture. He's also, as you well know, one of the most popular speakers and teachers on the Catholic scene today, lecturing at literally thousands of venues in this country and around the world. He's appeared countless times on EWTN. I can't think of anyone who's done more to realize the dream of Vatican II, that there might be a renewal of appreciation for the Bible in the Catholic Church. I'm very honored to call Scott Hahn a friend, and it's my great pleasure to present him to you today. Dr. Hahn, please. Thank you, Father Bob, and special thanks to, to Bill and Lois Mackesy for your generosity, for your friendship, and coming to class last semester. This is a very significant time for us in Chicago. We've seen the passing of the torch from Cardinal George, who Father Bob and I were just privileged to visit a couple of hours ago, and I know he would appreciate your prayers, and he gave us his blessing. And now to see Archbishop Supich coming on, it's really exciting to see all the potential for the new evangelization. I think sometimes we are too close to momentous events to realize their significance, and I think we find ourselves at a time like that now. You go back five years, and you can see the passing of the torch in so many ways with the Synod on the new evangelization. You go back 10 years to 2005, and that's when we had to say goodbye to now St. John Paul II. You go back 25 years and you will discover Redemptoris Missio, which has been nicknamed the Magna Carta of the New Evangelization. But I think we really need to go back 50 years to get historical perspective on who we are and what we're doing and why these times are so significant. Because you'll recall that 50 years ago, we reached the dramatic climax of the Second Vatican Council. For us as Catholics, timing is everything. I mean, for us as humans, I can recall how on our fifth wedding anniversary, we had our second child. So we couldn't spend the evening in the restaurant, we spent it in the hospital instead. Five years later, Kimberly and I decided to celebrate our 10th anniversary by sleeping in and then going out for a fine dinner, but sleeping in didn't work because it happened to be the fifth birthday of our little son, Gabriel. And so while we were trying to sleep in, we could hear them arguing downstairs, and so when I came down, I found Michael and Gabriel at each other's throats, acting like anything but archangels. <laughs> and I turned to my oldest son, Michael, and said, what is it? He said, you've got to stop him, Dad. And I'm like, Michael, it's his fifth birthday. Let him go. No, you don't understand. He's going around the neighborhood telling everybody that he was born on the same day that you and Mom got married. <laughs> 
So I tried my best to explain the distinction between day and date, but it was entirely missed to a five-year-old. But for the sake of his mom, I insisted that he follow his older brother's advice. You know, we don't always have a sense of timing, but we need to recover one, I think, at this point in history to understand the significance of the new evangelization. Because a lot of people tend to think of it as ecclesiastical jargon, as the newest program that will justify more committees in this sort of thing. But when you go back 50 years and you look carefully at what happened in the Second Vatican Council that convened in 62 and climaxed in 65, I think you're going to see what others have noticed, and that is this theme of evangelization exploded in a way that was entirely unexpected. The late Cardinal Dallas compared Vatican I to Vatican II to emphasize on the one hand the similarity, the continuity. There was no revolution at Vatican II. There was no rupture. On the other hand, there is a contrast because the Latin term evangelium is used only once in the documents of Vatican I, and it's used with reference to the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In contrast, evan evangelium, where we get evangelize, evangelizing, evangelization, occurs more than 200 times in the documents of Vatican II. And it's not just the quantity, it's the quality, the emphasis that is placed. And indeed, after St. John the Twenty-Third was called home to heaven, and Cardinal Montini replaced him. His successor chose the name Pope Paul VI, and when asked why, since there hadn't been a pope named Paul for hundreds of years, he explained his reasoning. He wanted to pattern his ministry after the apostle to the Gentiles, which he proceeded to enact by becoming, many people don't remember this, the very first pope in history to make apostolic journeys to other continents to do what? To evangelize which he began to do even before Vatican II concluded in 65 by going as a pilgrim to the Holy Land in 64. And then he also came to the America in 1965, to New York City of all places, and evangelized at the United Nations. In 66 and 67, he went to Portugal in Turkey, in 68 to Colombia, in 69 to Uganda. And then 1970 turned out to be the banner year for his evangelizing. He traveled and preached the gospel in Iran, East Pakistan, the Philippines, West Samoa, Australia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Sri Lanka, setting all these records that have been practically forgotten because of what his successor did, and that is St. John Paul II, who clocked in well over a million kilometers and over a hundred apostolic journeys. I can't begin to enumerate all of those. And yet at the same time, we tend to forget that John Paul was basically picking up right where Paul VI left off. And even when he was getting too old to travel in the early 70s, he didn't stop this emphasis. In fact, he was calling Catholics across the, the world, the globe, to recognize the priority of evangelization. He brought together the bishops for a synod in Rome on how to evangelize in the modern world in 1974. And then he published what proved to be the most influential document of his whole ministry, Evangelii Nunciandi, on evangelization in the modern world, where he expressed his conviction that the basic duty of the church is to evangelize. Here is his thesis statement, and I quote, evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation most proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize, to be the channel of the gift of grace, to reconcile sinners with God the Father, and to perpetuate Christ's sacrifice in the Mass, which is the memorial of his death and glorious resurrection." Close quote. Notice how the Pope identified the Church's mission with evangelization. The Church's own identity is to evangelize. But also notice how inseparably united that is to the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, which we do every week of our lives as Catholics from cradle to the grave. And so it's, it's an interesting insight to see how the Church, as the mystical body, gathers for the Mass to sort of inhale the breath of God's Spirit, to ingest the Word of Christ, that Word made flesh in the Eucharist. And then when we hear those words, ita, misa, est, which is translated in various ways, the Mass is ended. That word misa is not only where we get the word Mass, of course, it's also where we get the word mission, because we are being sent out on a mission 
to breathe out the breath of God's Spirit and to share the word that we have just consumed and communed upon. And I think this is exactly what John Paul recognized. And so when he began to evangelize at a whole new level, he also was the one who coined the expression, the new evangelization. As much as Paul VI emphasized evangelizing, he never used that phrase, the new evangelization. John Paul used it for the first time in what appears to have been a somewhat unscripted moment. It's when he went back to Poland for the nine days that changed the world, as that documentary is entitled that covers those amazing days. It was when he went back to Krakow, where he had been archbishop, to Nova Huda, which the Marxists had designed to be a kind of worker's paradise, a factory town for families that didn't have a church. Of course, back then, Bishop Wojtyla would celebrate the Christmas Mass outside in the hills where thousands would gather in defiance of the authorities. But in May of 79, before his first year was done, he went there and proclaimed the need for the new evangelization. And it didn't leave people to wonder what he meant, because he clarified the fact that it's not new for the church to evangelize, but what is the new evangelization? It is about re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. And of course, he was looking out at a face, at a sea of faces of his own fellow Poles who had suffered from the Nazis and then the Soviets as well. And so he recognized the need to really experience spiritual renewal. It's interesting, though, because he didn't use the phrase again for another four years. It wasn't until he came back to America and spoke to our bishops in North, Central, and South America at a meeting in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And that's where he didn't just use the phrase for a second time and clarify once again that evangelization in the primary sense is sharing the gospel with those who have never heard of Jesus before. But the new evangelization is precisely about re-evangelizing the de-Christianized in a post-Christian secularized context such as we see in the Americas. And he didn't just use it a second time, he used it dozens of times, hundreds in all. But he also explained that his intention back then was in fact to make this priority number one. And so in the early 80s, as he was talking this up, he also identified the year 1992 is a semi-official launch for the new evangelization. And when he was pressed as to why wait, he explained that that would mark the 500th anniversary of the founding and the first evangelizing of the Americas. You go back 500 years to 1492, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, the most populous Catholic countries in the world back then were what? Spain, Italy, France, you fast forward five centuries, and what are they today? In first place, Brazil. In second place, Mexico. And in the third place, our own United States. Countries that didn't even exist five centuries earlier are now the most populous Catholic countries, and the ones that once were have been so radically secularized they're struggling to recover what little is left of that legacy. And so implicitly, at least, he was putting the question to the Americas, given your influence, where are you going? Where will you be? And he wasn't prognosticating, he wasn't predicting the future, he was challenging the Americans to basically take hold of this calling and to recognize it as a challenge and an opportunity. As 1992 got closer, he began to bolster his efforts to prepare people. That's when he published Mission of the Redeemer, the Magna Carta of the New Evangelization in 1990, and that's where he stated quite clearly and boldly his call. He said, and I quote, I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. Now, this is not a man given to overstatement or a hyperbole. He meant what he said. He said what he meant. The moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church. Notice this is not just a task for the clergy or for the missionary societies. He issued no exemptions. Every baptized Catholic Christian is called to share the word of Christ, to share the good news of what it means to have God as Father, to have Jesus, the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, to give us the spirit that makes us a divine family. And then, of course, he shocked the world and even his own advisors in the early 90s by declaring that 
The next World Youth Day would be held where? In Denver, Colorado, of all places. His closest advisors had warned him that it just wouldn't work in secularized America, especially out there in Colorado, where all the previous World Youth Days had been held in dominant Catholic countries with a majority Catholic population, like Buenos Aires, like Chestahova, Santiago de Compostela, as well as Rome itself. And so what do young American secularized youth care about what this aging pontiff has to say? Well, when over a million descended upon Cherry Creek Park and Mile High Stadium, journalists later admitted to crumbling up their rough drafts, the articles that had announced the failure, because it was the turning point in his pontificate and it became something of a seismic event, not only in the U.S., where Denver became the fountainhead of grace for so many different efforts for the new evangelization, but throughout the whole world as well. And this is why back then, like so many people, I just assumed that the 90s represented the decade of the new evangelization. In fact, many people called it that, thinking that this was all a preparation for the Great Jubilee, the year 2000, when we would cross the threshold and enter a new century, a new millennium, and a new season of grace. But when you go back and study the documents, you'll discover that he never referred to the 90s as the decade of the new evangelization. What I found is that he referred to that decade as well, what he called the Advent season of the new evangelization. Now, clearly, he is employing an analogy drawn from our own experience as Catholics. What is Advent season? Well, it represents the first four Sundays of the liturgical year. But when Advent is finished, what remains? Well, 48 more Sundays. So when the decade of the 90s was done, was the new evangelization over? It had barely begun. And he understood it, even if few people did. But one other person who clearly understood it was then known as Cardinal Ratzinger. And then 10 years ago, he became known as Pope Benedict. And he went on to establish a new dicastery in the Roman Curia, this congregation for promoting the new evangelization. Again, not for more committees to form, to write new documents, but to mobilize every diocese, every parish, every Catholic family to breathe in the spirit, to receive the gift of the good news and the word of Christ, and then to go forth and to do that task of evangelization. Now, if John Paul picked up where Paul left off, if Pope Benedict picked up right where John Paul left off, how do you describe what Pope Francis has done? I mean, it's like the new evangelization in high definition, or as a friend of mine puts it, the new evangelization on steroids. Well, it's legal, it's safe, and it's something that we can learn from. And so whatever you call it, I think we can recognize that he has given to us some practical tips on what it means that we can, what, what, what it means for us to evangelize and practical steps that we can take. Now, he is fond of quoting Vatican II, as you must have noticed. And in the documents of Vatican II, it's quite clear that evangelization is not just the work of the clergy. For example, we read, and this is echoed or quoted in the catechism, lay people fulfill their mission by evangelization. That is the proclamation of Christ by word as well as the testimony of life. For lay people, this evangelization acquires a specific property and peculiar effectiveness because it is accomplished in the ordinary circumstances of the world. That's the key. But it goes on to conclude, the witness of life, however, is not the sole element in doing apostolic work. The true apostle is on the lookout for occasions of sharing Christ by word, either to unbelievers or to the faithful. So we can see how the new evangelization was anticipated precisely in the instructions that were given to ordinary lay Catholics 50 years ago in the teaching of Vatican II. But this has been amplified, in, embodied, incarnated in Pope Francis. And Father Tom already referred to Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, which is really not only the first official proclamation promulgated by Pope Francis, but you can hear his very heart when you read it. And you could tell because when he went down to South America for World Youth Day, what did he make the principal theme there? Well, not only evangelizing, but the joy of the gospel. He said to these young people, and I quote, evangelization in our time will only take place as the result of joy, contagious joy. 
And he went on to explain how enjoying the Catholic faith, experiencing the joy of Christ through scripture and prayer and fellowship, this is what makes our faith infectious. He said to the young people, and I quote, the joy of the gospel arises from a heart which in its poverty rejoices and marvels at the works of God, just like the heart of Our Lady, whom all generations call blessed. Think of John the Baptist, who even in the womb leapt for joy when she brought the Word made flesh there to the Judean hill country where her kinswoman Elizabeth lived. And I think that if we reflect upon it, we will see that this is the master key to the new evangelization. And this is why not just the clergy, but ordinary lay people will find doors opening because the joy of the Lord is our strength, as we read in Nehemiah 8.10. It's also a practical way that we can share. And why? Why is it the key to the new evangelization according to Pope Francis? Well, even if you can't defend the faith, even if you can't explain every doctrine or prove it all from the Bible, the one thing that you can do is this, enjoy being Catholic. That's the best way to evangelize friends, family, co-workers, and everybody else. And why? Because we know how the world offers us countless pleasures, but not a single joy that lasts. Whereas what Jesus Christ gives to us is a joy even in the midst of sorrow. And sometimes that joy is intensified when we face hardship. Joy is what other people will find irresistible. Joy is what other people will find more irrefutable than any argument we might use or any proof text we might deploy. And the fact is, whenever we find ourselves without joy, it's simply God's gentle way of reminding us that we too stand in need of conversion. This is what Pope Francis also explained to these millions of young people down there in Rio when he met with them for World Youth Day. He said, when you wake up in the morning and you don't feel joy, that's God's nudge gently reminding you that you've got to open your heart once again to the power and the life and the joy of the gospel. And this is why for us as Catholics, we have a different kind of theology of conversion. It's not just what happened to me when I was 14, finding my way out of the Allegheny County juvenile court system. It's not what just happened to me at the Easter Vigil in 1986 when I entered the Catholic Church. It's what happened to me earlier this morning when I woke up and made an, an act of consecration and went off to Mass at the John Paul Chapel, the most beautiful place in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also a reminder that conversion for us as Catholics is not over and done in a day. It isn't simply, simply a past event. It's ongoing. It's ever deepening. It's lifelong. And it never starts to get easy. Because what did Jesus explain to his disciples? That if anyone would follow me, he must take up his rosary beads. <laughs> yeah, or his bravery. No. And when is a cross ever going to get easy? When is it going to ever feel just like fun? It's going to be hard. It involves suffering and sacrifice. But suffering is what transforms love from being a warm, fuzzy feeling into a joyful act and a commitment. And this is where we can find a way to not only share the gospel, but also be reached by it. Again, be re-evangelized ourselves. We're not just out to reach them. We are them. And we need to be reached on a regular basis to understand that the grace of conversion is something that not only do we need, but we can enjoy day in and day out throughout our lives. The second key to the new evangelization that I think is available for us, and it grows right out of the first one, is friendship. This is something that you find, again, in the teachings of Vatican II. This is what you find emphasized by John Paul, and most especially by Pope Francis. Friendship, and no wonder, because when Jesus was preparing his disciples for his departure in the upper room, he not only gave to them the Eucharist, that's a gift enough, but he also gave to them this farewell discourse in the midst of which he explained what? He said, I no longer call you slaves because the slave doesn't know what the master is doing. I now call you friends, friendship with God, intimacy with the Almighty. It's almost unthinkable, indeed it was, to the ancient Greeks and Romans, and yet what we can't do for God, God did for us 
by coming down to us to raise us up to him, by assuming what is ours in order to give us what is his, and in order to establish the unthinkable, divine friendship. And if that is the message of the gospel, that we are to enter into a personal relationship with Jesus that goes beyond just an acquaintance, but really enters into friendship, fraternity, where he becomes the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. This is an invitation into the family of God. And if friendship is the message, that it also must be the medium. You know, to draw from Marshall McLuhan, who back in the 60s as a, a convert to the Catholic faith, observed how with TV, the medium is the message. Well, with the gospel, it's even truer. Because if we're trying to convince the world that there is a bond of friendship with the Almighty that Christ has established, that we can enter into not a factory, but a family, not a contract, but a covenant, into something that is deeper and stronger than any natural human family that this planet has ever seen. That is good news indeed. But if that's the sort of friendship that Christ has come to establish, then friendship is the only natural way to communicate the supernatural mystery. And so entering into friendship, not in a manipulative way, but just entering more deeply into purposeful friendship with people who might never darken the doorways of your parish, who might never hear the homily that you'd hope that they would. In fact, the only homily they might ever hear is your friendship, the work that you do alongside of them, nine to five, day in and day out. And I think if we recognize this, we can see why it is that we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to be prepared to enter into arguments and destroy theirs. Because, you know, if you show up to work on Monday morning and it's time for the coffee break and around 10 a.m., you're standing over by the water cooler. Nobody's going to think you're weird if you mention the fact that on Friday night over the weekend you went to this new movie and you recommend it. Nobody's going to turn on you and say, stop imposing your theatrical taste on the rest of us. <laughs> and if you go on to recommend some restaurant that just opened and some dish that you ordered and their fine cuisine, nobody's going to say, hey, stop shoving your culinary taste down our throats. And why won't they? Because that's what friends do. And that's what establishes and extends friendship in a work environment. And so if you could say in a sincere and honest way, non-manipulative, that you prayed, you've also worked hard alongside of these men and women, you could say something like, you know what, I grew up Catholic, but I took it for granted for so much of my life. In the last few months, maybe the last year or two, I've really been enjoying my faith. Now, chances are nobody's gonna say, hey, look, there's eight minutes left in the coffee break. Preach it, sister. <laughs> You know, it's your turn for the homily of the week. But the fact is, you might be asked out for lunch. You might run into a person on a Saturday morning at the soccer field. And they might be able to open up their heart and share in friendship what it is they're struggling with so that they can admit, hey, I grew up Catholic or I grew up without any faith. What is it about being a Catholic that you're enjoying? And in the process, you can deepen the friendship. You can also show them a joy that the world will never offer them. And finally, I want to explain a third key. And this is found also in sacred scripture. And that is the Holy Eucharist, which is Christ himself. I remember back in 92, when the new evangelization was sort of being launched semi-officially, then Cardinal George, he was not yet here in Chicago, but he gave an address that I heard at the Fellowship of Catholic Scholars. And the words that I heard him say, I'll never forget. He said, all evangelizers proclaim Christ. Catholic evangelizers proclaim a Eucharistic Christ. And at first, I didn't really understand what that meant because at the time, I had been a Catholic for about six years, but I'd been an evangelical Protestant, a non-Catholic, for more than twice as long. And so I thought I knew what it meant to evangelize, and it's a simple process that you can get over and done with, not only in a day, but in less than an hour. You could do it if the plane was just coming down for a landing. You could do it on an elevator in three or four floors. We, we were taught the four spiritual laws. God loves you, you sinned, Christ died for that, and now you can choose to believe and accept that gift. And what would we disagree with as Catholics? Not a word of that. But whereas that was the end game, because you would lead them in the sinner's prayer, I mean, in three or four floors, you could say, do you know, to the fellow next to you in the elevator, God loves you. But like me, you struggle, you sin. But Christ died for that. 
So now you got to choose what you're going to do with that gift. And the doors would open. You could walk out of the lobby and just lead them in what we call the sinner's prayer, where you sum up those four basic principles and shake his hand and say, you've got a relationship with Jesus, a personal relationship with Christ. But you wouldn't turn around and invite him to receive First Holy Communion. He's not ready. So I wondered, what does this mean? You know, and it wasn't just Cardinal George at the time, it was also Pope John Paul who published an article simply entitled, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. Well, how does that work? Well, it's a personal relationship to begin with, but it becomes something more than just simply a personal relationship. It becomes committed. It becomes an interpersonal friendship that is deep. But even that isn't enough. Indeed, the goal is to enter into a covenant of interpersonal communion. The Catechism is very clear on this, echoing again not only the teachings of Vatican II, but also the early church fathers. And this is where the new evangelization has some lessons to learn from the old evangelization. Because what you hear in the Catechism, paragraph 1229, is this, that becoming a Christian is accomplished as a journey in several stages in which certain essential elements need to be present. First, the proclamation of the word, and that entails acceptance of the gospel, initial conversion. That's the personal relationship. But then secondly, learning the profession of faith, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer. This is not only evangelizing now, this is what was known as catechizing. But when you start catechizing those who were initially converted, the good news doesn't stop. If anything, it gets even higher. And then the third level is baptism itself, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, admission to Eucharistic communion. And so it's evangelizing, it's catechizing, it's sacramentalizing. It's a three-stage process. And the catechism is emphatic that this is what conversion means and why evangelization is constant, as conversion is. In fact, in paragraph 1617, we read that the entire Christian life bears the mark of Christ's spousal love for the church and for every one of us. Already in baptism, we enter into the family of God. It's a nuptial mystery. It is, so to speak, the nuptial bath which precedes the wedding feast, the Eucharist, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can hear the analogy that the church has been employing for 2,000 years. It isn't just a personal relationship. It isn't just a, a, a commitment. It is a covenant which includes those first two, but takes it to the third level. And I can see also an analogy in my own life experience because about 37 years ago, I ran into a gal on campus and I was just smitten by her. She was beautiful, she was funny, she was intelligent. I couldn't get my mind off of her. And for the next few weeks, I kept running into her everywhere, in the library, in the cafeteria, in the mail room, outside of her class, even in the lobby of the girl's dorm where she lived. She didn't imagine what I was doing there. Well, I couldn't tell her. Her roommate had given to me her schedule. So all of these chance encounters were carefully pre-planned and programmed until I could get up enough nerve to ask her out on a date. And she agreed, and we went. And after two or three dates, I had a personal relationship with Kimberly. And we were entering into courtship. But that wasn't the end game. That wasn't the goal any more than it's just about dating Jesus. The real next stage came on January 23rd in the lightly falling snow while we were standing at the top of Rainbow Bridge over Wolf Creek when I got down on my knees and I pulled out the ring and I popped the question. I like to say in the Gospels, Jesus gave sight to the blind. That night he took sight away from she who could see. <laughs> she accepted my proposal right on the spot. We hugged and we kissed and we danced across Rainbow Bridge and to celebrate, I took her out to Mr. Donut, of all places. Big cheapskate. But that's where our relationship entered a whole new level of commitment. And that's where I also learned the truism, that when you marry a gal, you don't just marry her, you marry her whole family. Yeah, well, I got to know her parents and her siblings, and I wondered, what am I getting myself into? Well, in my case, I was clearly marrying up, but still, it was a whole lot more than a personal friendship. This kind of engagement engaged our lives at a much deeper level, where we were discovering how the inner logic of love requires the gift of life, the gift of self, and that came on August 18th, 35 years ago, when we didn't just seal a deal or tie a knot. 
We entered into a covenant of interpersonal communion. We celebrated a sacrament that we didn't fully understand until years later when we both became Catholic. But in the process, we also discovered how it is that we experience joy and how it is that friendship is meant to lead to family bonds and why it is that following our Lord himself, the church in antiquity and now today uses this model of friendship and family life and marital love to express the joy of the gospel. And yet at the same time, it explains the need for the new evangelization. Because if the new evangelization is about re-evangelizing the de-Christianized, about the post-Christian culture, the force of secularization, and how many ex-Catholics have drifted away, as we know all the statistics that bear it out, then we can also recognize the analogy works in the opposite direction as well. Because how many people who are married are lonely and miserable and in need of tapping the graces of that sacrament and discovering what really is involved in the sacrament of matrimony. A sacrament is not primarily some ritual that we do for God. It's primarily a mystery that he does for us to give us what we need to make up for what we lack and in the process discover the deeper dimension of love that is not merely human but divine. It happened to us. We were in springtime when we were engaged and it was like a nice hot summer when we got married. I won't go into any of the details for the sake of discretion. But when I became a Catholic in 86 and she didn't become one until 90, we entered into a long, hard, cold winter like the one that we're finally getting out of this week. And it was really hard even after she entered the church in 1990. I thought for sure, you know, it's going to thaw, it's going to warm up, it's going to get back to normal, but it didn't. Not for weeks, not for months. We took somebody's advice, which I would share with you. We went for counseling to a really good Catholic counselor. We went for months. I met alone, she met alone, then we got together. He would ask me questions about where we first kissed, where I told her I loved her for the first time, where we first danced, what was the first movie, and I had to go and rent the video. We had to drive back to the restaurant. We had to go to the theater as well. And we danced to Orleans, You're Still the One. We renewed the wellsprings, and in the process, we rediscovered the deeper dimension of marital love and friendship in a way that I never knew marriages could have. And I'd like to say, ever since those days, it's just been summer ever since, but the fact is we continue to go through those seasons of life, like any married couple, the seasons of love. And so just as conversion is ongoing and ever deepening for us in our relationship with Christ, so also at home. We've got to make marriage believable. We've got to make the sacrament as a mystery of divine intimacy, something that can be decoded, and not just by the books that are written, but by the lives that we lead. This is the new evangelization. Again, where the only homily some people will ever hear are the lives that they witness and the marriages that we recover and the love that we experience being resurrected. And finally, I would like to say this, that I had one of those concrete experiences that I, I just cherish. It wasn't only with my bride, it was also with an old buddy of mine I hadn't seen for decades. I was at the Pittsburgh airport, guy walked up to me and said, are you Scott Hahn? And I said, I sure am. And he said, you don't recognize me? And I'm thinking, if you watch EWTN, TV's a, a, a one-way medium, you know? I can't see you, you can see me. And then he said, St. Clair High School, 75, and that's when I recognized Chris, this old buddy of mine who was on the swim team, and he was a cradle Catholic like most of his other friends. I wasn't. And he couldn't wait to share his joy. He said, I have looked forward to this day for so long because I am now what you were. I am now a Bible-believing New Testament Christian. And I'm like, wow, that's interesting, Chris, because I'm now a, a Bible-believing New Testament Catholic Christian. And his jaw dropped. Uh, what? He was in shock. And so a week later, we were back on the phone, and he couldn't wait after exchanging the greetings and the pleasantries to put to me the question that I apparently put to him and to his friends on a regular basis in the cafeteria. He's like, do you remember sitting down with us? We'd be talking Steelers or the Pirates of the Weather. And you would say stuff like, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? Remember that? I'm like, no, but that sounds like what I would have done. He said, oh, you did, more than once. And you'd always 
go on to point out that the mass was a meal, the sacrifice is Calvary. I'm like, yeah, that too sounds like what I would have said. He said, well, let, let me turn the cafeteria tables around on you and put it to you. Where in the New Testament do you find this sacrifice of the Mass? Because I'm convinced now of what you said then, that the Mass is a meal, that Calvary is the sacrifice. And I said, first, Chris, let's identify how much common ground we have as Christians, because I still believe that Calvary is the sacrifice and the Mass is a meal. It's the Last Supper. It's the Lord's Supper. But I want to propose to you that it has to be more than that in order for Calvary to be what you and I both agree on. Because you and I both see Calvary as the consummation of a sacrifice, but nobody at Good Friday, nobody on Golgotha would have seen it that way. And he said, why not? I said, well, as devout Jews who might have followed Jesus for years, they would have seen Jesus dying on the cross, but they wouldn't have seen it as a sacrifice because for a sacrifice to take place, it had to be in the Jerusalem temple on top of an altar with a Levite priest standing by to preside at the liturgy of offering, whereas Jesus was crucified outside the walls where there were no altars or priests standing by to offer the sacrifice. What we would have recounted to our family members that night would not have been a sacrifice. It would have been a Roman execution, plain and simple and a rather brutal one at that. So the question is this, Chris, how in the world does a Roman execution suddenly get turned into a holy sacrifice? One so holy that it retires all of the animal offerings that were ever offered. And he's like, wow, that's a hard question. I said, it was for me too when I found it in the writings of the early church fathers. But the early church fathers were rather unanimous in finding an answer in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, where Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And he, so, and he goes on to say, let us keep the feast, which he then explains in terms of the Eucharist in subsequent chapters there in 1 Corinthians. But I said, Chris, what Paul says that the early church fathers showed me is the key for how a Roman execution suddenly becomes more than an execution, but truly a sacrifice. You can only understand Good Friday by looking at it in the light of what Jesus did on Holy Thursday, because what was he doing with the disciples in the upper room? He was celebrating the Passover. But that's not all, he was fulfilling it because he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, but he wasn't fulfilling it, Chris, to do an end with it, to retire it, but to transform the Passover of the Old Covenant into the Passover of the New. And what was the Passover in the Old Covenant? Was it just a meal? No, it was always a sacrifice first and foremost, and then the meal was a sacrificial communion. But it was a sacrifice first and foremost. You could just ask any lamb, he'd tell you if they could. And if that's true in the Old Covenant, it isn't less true in the New, but far more because Christ himself is laying down his life for us. And this alone explains what he would have said to those disciples that they never heard before because they were familiar with the whole Passover liturgy until he spoke those words that we heard so much growing up, but they never heard before when he said, this is my body which will be given up for you. What was that rhetorical flourish? Nobody interrupted and asked for an explanation. And yet, you know, it was back on track with the ordinary Passover Seder until near the end. And that's when Jesus took the chalice and spoke words again that we've heard so much, Chris, that they never heard before. When he says something like this, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. There he goes again. What is this new ritual, rhetoric? You know, is there any reality to this? They wouldn't have known. And in a few moments, they had left the upper room. But in the events that followed, they would have seen that this was more than rhetoric. This was more than ritual. That was his body and it was given up. And this blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And so you can see, Chris, how the Eucharist as the Passover of the New Covenant couldn't be just a meal or it wouldn't be a Passover. It is where the sacrifice is initiated. But it's more than words, the proof of which is precisely when he lays his body down and he pours his blood out. I said, he wasn't losing his life in a Roman execution on Friday if he was already freely laying it down as a gift of divine love and mercy on Holy Thursday. He wasn't the victim of Roman violence as much as the, as the victim of divine mercy and love in the Eucharist. But if the Eucharist is just a meal, Chris, then Calvary is just an execution. 
But if in fact the Eucharist as the Passover, the new covenant is more than a meal, but where the sacrifice is initiated, where he's laying down his life and making it a gift of love, then and only then can we see how Holy Thursday transforms Good Friday from being an execution to being the consummation of the sacrifice that was initiated when the Eucharist was instituted. And then Easter Sunday is what transforms that sacrifice into a sacrament, which we can now do in memory of him precisely because his body is no longer bleeding on the cross or buried in a tomb. It's raised from the dead. And that is who is really present in every Eucharist. That is who presides in the sacrifice. He said, back up, what was that thing you just said? I said a lot of things, Chris. You said, if the mass is just a meal, then what? Then Calvary is just an execution. Yeah, it's like Mufasa. Oh. He was struck by it, he was like, whoa. Just parenthetically, I just watched Lion King with my two-year-old grandson three times this weekend, and that's why it's Mufasa on my brain here. In any case, he was stunned by that, just as I had been several years earlier. And I went on to explain why, it, for me, was a real career killer. Because all I wanted to be was a New Testament Christian. All I wanted to do was to follow the Word of God that I read in the New Testament and how it fulfilled the Old. But what I discovered along the way is that Jesus only uses that word, testament, or covenant, diatheke in the Greek. He only employs the phrase, the New Covenant, one time. Not in the public ministry, only in the upper room. And when he took that chalice of the Passover and declared those words that we know so well, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new testament. You can translate the Greek phrase either way. It means the same thing. And then he goes on to say, what? Do this in memory of me. Do this. What is this? This is the Eucharist, but he didn't call it the Eucharist. What did he call it? He called it the new testament. He called it the new covenant. He said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new testament. And then what did he say? Write this in memory of me. He said, do this. This is the Eucharist, and the Eucharist is the only thing Jesus ever called the New Testament. So the question that you put to me that I once put to you is, where in the New Testament do you find the sacrifice of the Mass? Chris, the fact is, when he instituted the Eucharist, it's the only thing he ever called the New Covenant, the New Testament. For me to be a New Testament Christian meant to become a Eucharistic Catholic, because the New Testament was a sacrament long before it started to become a document. And that's when you read the document. It's like a sign that points beyond itself to not just the inspired word, but to the incarnate word who comes to us in the Eucharist. We had this conversation go on, not only for over an hour that week, but for weeks and for months. I won't bore you with all of the other details, but suffice it to say that almost a year later, after several weeks when he had gone dark, he wouldn't he wouldn't call me, he wouldn't return my calls. I wondered if I had gone a little too fast, I pushed a little too hard, like I am doing with you, the slunchin. And then he called me out of the blue one Saturday afternoon. I noticed the caller ID, hey, long time no here. What's up, Chris? He said, well, I just finished the Lamb's Supper, and then I read this book of yours called Lord Have Mercy on the Healing Power of Confession. You know, I went to med school, I never thought of confession as free health care, comprehensive coverage, that helps. I'm like, I'm glad, because no government could ever deliver on that kind of promise. This is eternal life insurance. He said, yeah. Well, anyway, Carol and I finished that book last week, and we're driving home from going to confession for the first time in over 30 years. And I was stunned. And he was in a good mood, and that was surprising, too. I'm like, wow, confession after three decades, and you're still in a good mood? He said, well, what we're in a good mood about is tomorrow we're getting ready to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ for the first time in over 30 years, and we can't wait. And I'll be honest, as I reflected upon those circumstances and our relationship and how we've now entered into a deeper bond of friendship than we ever had before, and we share the joy of the gospel in an entirely new way, it is a Eucharistic experience that we share. Not because you have to have all the answers, but just because you have entered into a period of life where you enjoy being a Catholic Christian, where you open yourself up to receiving Holy Communion and experience a grace of conversion that is going to prepare you for life everlasting and for a family that isn't merely human but divine. This is who we are as Catholic Christians. And this is why the new evangelization is not beyond our pay grade. 
It is something that each and every one of us can and must do. And when we discover that we can do it, we'll also discover how much the good news is better than we thought. If you simply believe something because the church's authority tells you you have to, it's kind of hard to get excited about it. But I remember graduating from high school and college, getting good grades, but it wasn't until I began to share those lessons as a teacher that they really sank in. And so it is for all of us. When we get to share in the context of friendship, the joy of the Lord and what it means to be a Catholic and to receive this flesh and blood bond with God in the Eucharist to become his family, brothers and sisters in Christ, the joy of the gospel is more than a cliche. It's more than a document. It can become an accurate description of what we enter into for the rest of our lives and what we can draw others into as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and for the joy of this good news that you have become much more than our Creator, our Lawgiver, our Lord, and our Judge. You have become Abba Father, like no father on this planet could ever be. And you've given to us, as your beloved children, gifts that go beyond anything I could lavish upon my own. And in the name of Jesus, I pray for you to pour out the gifts and the graces of the Holy Spirit upon these, my brothers and sisters, your beloved children. We also pray that you would equip us to go forth and to share the joy of the gospel and to enter more deeply into friendships. And not only at work, but especially at home, and not just with our kids, but with our spouses as well. Lord Jesus, we pray especially for the marriages here in your church throughout the Chicagoland area, that we could say as husbands what you say through your priest, this is my body which is given up for you, that we would enable, that we would be empowered to enter into the mystery of your love for your bride to share it with ours. Help us then and hear us as we pray the family prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Mary of the Lake, pray for us in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Real briefly, I just wanted to mention that the talk is drawn from a book called Evangelizing Catholics, a mission manual for the new evangelization. I also wanted to mention another one called Consuming the Word, the New Testament and the Eucharist in the early church. I kind of wrote it for Chris after this experience that we share. I might also mention my favorite early church fathers. I put together an anthology of patristic sources with my best friend Mike Aquilina called Living the Mysteries, A Guide for Unfinished Christians. It's 50 days of readings from the early church fathers who connect the old and the new with the sacraments. There's another book too, Reasons to Believe, How to Understand, Explain, and Defend the Catholic Faith. In case you have family members or friends who have questions about Mary or the Pope or purgatory or the saints or the sacraments and these sorts of things. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the privilege of sharing with you and thank you for your time and attention. God bless you.